Uh, so I'm going to share just a, a short summary of, of this study that, that I helped um, put together. It was a two-year effort with 18 different researchers across Princeton University and a number of other institutions. So there's a lot of, lot of work behind it. We actually came out with a, an interim report uh, last December, um, which was timed in part because of the change in the administration in the United States. And uh, that drew a lot of attention. Um, we've been sort of cleaning things up and we'll issue a final report, um, which you'll get some sneak preview of, of in my talk today. Um, and as I mentioned, our study has gotten a lot of coverage. And I think the reason is that we've gone into a lot of detail as to what it would look like on the ground um, to have a net zero economy by 2050 in the United States. This isn't focused only on cities as, as the event is, but it's, but it's for the whole country. And of course, cities are gonna play a big role in that. And so I'll give you some examples of the kinds of, of communications um, in our study that I think caught the attention of a lot of folks in the media, but also across governments, uh, federal and state governments, as well as in academia and other, other sectors. So what we did in our study was to develop five different uh, pathways using a model, a, a suite of models. Uh, and I won't go into the details of it. The, there was a URL on the cover, cover uh, slide that gave you a website where you can go and download the report and see much more detail than what I'm gonna go through. Um, but our model basically um, comes up with a, uh, the, the combination of technologies that are needed to meet future uh, energy service demands, things like vehicle miles traveled, building square footage, um, you know, conditioned with by cooling or heating and so on. Um, so all of these five scenarios meet the same energy services that, you know, the services that we want from energy, uh, but they do them in different ways. And, and the way we uh, develop different pathways is to set the constraints a little bit differently for each one. So for example, so what I'm showing you here is the total primary energy for the, for the United States in 2020 on the left, and you can see it's dominated by fossil fuels today. The reference scenario in 2050 is sort of a no new policies case where we don't do much very differently, and we end up with, with a similar mix of, of energy sources in 2050. Um, and then the other five on the right are where we, we uh, force the model to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2050, um, and also meet all of the energy service demands that, 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 are, um, in, um, that are projected. So in the E plus scenario, this we, we, with these acronyms I'm gonna to refer to as we go through here, E plus means high electrification, um, and that's in particular for vehicles and for buildings. Um, heat pumps for heating in buildings, um, electric vehicles for light duty vehicles in particular, but also some uh, in heavier, heavy duty vehicles as well. The E minus scenario, um, we call it a less high electrification. We still have fairly aggressive electrification, but not as high. And you can see that um, as a result of that, um, we, we have a higher primary energy demand. We have a bit more oil in the mix still in 2050. Um, because we don't have as much electrification of transportation. Um, the, the third block over, we adopt this less high electrification, but we, we allow more biomass to be used in the energy system. In the first two, you can see the green section there represents biomass. And uh, in those first two bars, we constrain the amount of biomass to be such that we won't change any land use from today in order to supply that biomass. So we're using things like crop residues, forestry uh, thinnings uh, and so on uh, that doesn't change the land use. In the, in the third column there, we allowed, we relaxed that constraint and allowed some land use change. And you can see much more biomass gets used in that case. And then in the final two on the right, here we've adopted the, the high electrification uh, on the demand side and then we've we sort of pushed and pulled on the amount of solar and wind that we can have in the system. So in the RE minus pathway, we said, let's assume that we can't build solar and wind, uh, new solar and wind uh, much faster than we built it historically in the fastest year historically. And you can see that solar and wind, the blue and the yellow there 
are a relatively smaller piece of the pie in, in 2050. And then in the RE plus case, we um, uh, required that the entire energy system be renewable energy by 2050. So fossil fuels have, have uh, finished by then. Um, we also, in that case, we, uh, we prohibited any new nuclear power plant construction, and we did not allow any underground storage of CO2. And you can see in that fifth bar that wind and solar play, play a huge role. Um, by comparison, in the fourth bar, it's a small, relatively smaller role, and nuclear, which is the orange one, uh, takes up a lot of the slack on the, on the power side. And then the last thing to note on this slide is down at the bottom, it, it shows what the amount of CO2 uh, capture that goes on and storage in these scenarios. In all of them, it's a significant amount of CO2 that gets captured. I'll talk more about where that comes from. Um, except in the RE plus case, there we did not allow storage of CO2, but we still do need to capture CO2. And the reason we need to capture is because we need carbon in order to make liquid fuels in combination with hydrogen in order to meet fuel demands that there are still there. We can't electrify everything. So that's our five set of scenarios. And we, we don't have a favorite among these. We just wanted to illustrate what the implications are if we choose as a, as a nation to go down one road or another. And to, to start out, we, we looked at what the cost of all of this would be. And what we found is, is pretty surprising, actually, that the, the cost of the energy for the energy system over time is not, not higher and may, may even be lower than sort of what we're accustomed to spending on energy as a fraction of GDP. Um, and so it's, it's, it looks like an affordable transition if we can make it, make it go. Um, an important distinction, though, is that the costs go from being largely operating costs for fuels, for example, to being uh, much more capital investment. So we need to invest upfront, and then we pay for those investments over time the same way you would, you would take out a mortgage to buy a house and then pay that mortgage off over time. So it's, a, it's an investment of capital that's required, and it's, it's on the order of two to four times the, uh, the, the, the level of, of capital costs annually than what we're, we're, what we're accustomed to. So that's a, that's a distinction that, that is quite important. And in our study, we, we've gone through in detail and, and costed out uh, where all these capital investments would need to go. Um, and, and over the 2020s decade, the next 10 years, yeah, you can see here, the, a lot of it goes into wind and solar electricity on the left. Um, you have electricity transmission in the light blue and so on. There are investments that are needed across all of the economy um, to do this. And it's a two and a half trillion dollars of additional capital investment in the 20s um, relative to a, a sort of a do nothing um, approach. And this, this uh, area plot gives you an idea of the kinds of, of areas where we delved into detail in our study. Uh, and in all of our pathways, these five pathways, we use six what we call pillars of decarbonization. Efficiency and electrification is number one. Clean electricity, which means uh, solar and wind, but also transmission that's needed to move that electricity across the country. And firm power, which is uh, available to, be, to balance the variability of wind and solar. We also need some clean fuels. We can't electrify everything. And bioenergy plays a big role. Hydrogen plays a big role. And also synthetic fuels that I mentioned, combining carbon and hydrogen. Carbon capture, utilization, and storage, I also mentioned is important. And then the fifth and the sixth uh, pillars are reduced non-CO2 emissions, things like methane and nitrous oxides, which also need to be reduced. And enhancing land sinks, that is absorption of carbon in soils and trees. And in our model, we, we, our model uh, handles the first four of these. We, we have assumptions based on expert input um, from some of our team research team on what the projections are for reduced non-CO2 and enhanced land sinks. So let me show you some, some results. First on physical plant and infrastructure. That first pillar, electrification and efficiency, these are really essential to, to reduce the amount of energy that we need to provide the services that we want. 
And this is, this is particularly important in urban areas where a lot of the energy service demands uh, exist. And you can see that um, we reduce the final energy demand by you know, 20 to 25 to 35 percent in our, in our two demand scenarios. Um, and we also, you can see, increase the amount of electricity considerably in the mix, for example, in that E plus scenario. So by reducing the final energy demand, that makes it easier to uh, supply the energy through things like solar and wind. And solar and wind are, in fact, the cornerstones of the electricity supply system and of the whole energy system in our scenarios. And while we're reducing our final energy use, our amount of electricity that we're using goes up considerably. So we've doubled or quadrupled the amount of electricity, depending on the scenario. The only one where wind doesn't play quite as much of a role is in that RE minus scenario, the fourth one over or the second one over from the right. Um, where you see nuclear plays a big role and natural gas with carbon capture plays a big role going out to 2050. And what those, those solar and wind uh, numbers mean on that prior graph is that we're building each year uh, and installing solar and wind capacity at rates at which we haven't done it previously. Um, this is a little bit busy, but it, it shows you over on the right that the US record installation of of uh, utility scale solar and wind capacity was about 25 gigawatts. And that was last year. And you can see in all of our scenarios, we're, we're on average exceeding that in uh, every time, time period within, our, within the modeling period from 2020 to 2030. Um, so that's a challenge. And we went further and, and mapped out where we might actually put solar and wind of that, of that uh, magnitude. And this is roughly what the country looked like in 2020. The blue represents wind farms. The orange is hard to see here, but there is orange uh, solar farms, particularly in Southern California. And by 2030, we've quadrupled the amount of solar and wind installed. We've increased the transmission system by about 60%. And we, you can see the transmission lines here. And we did this mapping by, by uh, at very fine resolution and at excluding areas that would not be suitable for installing um, uh, wind and solar, for example, in national parks and, and in dense urban areas and so on. Um, so this is 2030 and then by 2050. And this is for the E plus scenario. Um, and that's not our highest solar and wind scenario. The R E plus would, would be even denser than this. And it's, it's these kinds of visualizations that I think um, really caught the attention of, of a lot of people that it really, really dramatically illustrates what, what it means to get to net zero for the country. We also can zoom in on this, on our, on our, um, our siting work down to a scale of a, on the order of a couple of miles. So this is St. Louis um, as it is today. And in 2050, we have wind farms and solar farms ringing the city. Um, in the way that we developed the, and the, the, the siting of these. So um, it, the landscape looks very different in 2050 than it does today um, across the country with our, with our scenarios. Then um, switching to CO2 capture and uh, storage, this graph shows you in 2050 what the sources of CO2 are in the upper panel um, uh, that are captured and then what's how that CO2 is used and in the bottom panel. And so most of that CO2 is sequestered underground in four of the five scenarios. In one, we use that carbon and turn it back into synthetic liquids, as I mentioned. Um, the sources on the top here, what stands out is the green, which is biomass derived um, uh, CO2. And the reason biomass is quite, um, uh, valued here is because the carbon in biomass comes out of the atmosphere when you're growing the biomass. And by capturing and storing it underground, you've created negative emissions. And that makes room in the, in the atmosphere for uh, emissions that are difficult to eliminate altogether, for example, nitrous oxide from um, fertilizers in agriculture. And so biomass is a very important part of the energy system in, this, in our scenarios. <clears throat> 
and we've mapped out in quite a bit of detail, detail at the county level um, where you would have biomass facilities. And the, the light green color here are biomass conversion into hydrogen. And hydrogen is, as I mentioned, is, a, is an important uh, fuel in the energy system by the time you get to 2050. <clears throat> and this mapping of the biomass systems also takes into consideration where it's possible to store CO2. And the gray areas on the map here are uh, prospective regions where CO2, underground CO2 storage will be possible. Most of the capacity for that is in the Gulf Coast, Texas, Louisiana region, but there are uh, various uh, basins around the country where um, storage of CO2 is, is, is feasible. And we've mapped out what a CO2 transportation network would look like that goes from these capture points and, and collects CO2 and brings it to these gray basin areas. Um, and what you can see here is we have a CO2 pipeline network by 2050 that's on the order of a quarter of the extent of today's natural gas transmission pipeline system. So it's a pretty significant um, industry that develops for CO2 transportation and storage. There's two different networks here, one to the west of the Rockies that serves the Pacific Coast states, and then one to the east of the Rockies that, that, that covers the rest of the country. And the total CO2 flow, just to, to put the, this industry in perspective, is, a, is by 2050 is on the order of 1.3 times the current US oil production. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry that's larger than the US oil industry today. So that's just a quick snapshot of some of the, the sort of the physical plant and infrastructure that, that would be needed in a net zero uh, economy. We've also developed a model to estimate what the, what the uh, employment impacts and what the workforce uh, in the energy sector is needed to, to deliver those, um, those pathways to net zero. Um, this is our estimate of the total employment in the energy sector. Um, it's on the order in the 2020s, just in the decade that we're in now, um, on the order of 3 million direct energy supply jobs. So here we only looked at the energy supply system. We didn't, we didn't look at uh, things like uh, electric vehicle manufacturing, for example, and what the employment would be there. Um, but just in the supply side, we see there's a, an increase of about a half a million jobs um, in the 2020s relative to a, the reference scenario where we don't do anything. And as you go out into the further in the time period, the more solar and wind that's in the energy mix in general, the more the, the employment opportunities there are. So in the case of the RE plus scenario on the far right, you see the, the number of jobs is, is much higher by 2050 because of all the solar and wind that is, is uh, in, included in that scenario. So it's the job story is is a pretty good news story for the most part, but we looked at the state by state at at where these jobs would be, and there's of course a lot of assumptions that go into an analysis like this. But um, and so there are different scenarios that could come out, but this is just one one illustration of that. And what you see is that in almost every state, you see the 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 trend is upward from 2020 to 2050 in terms of total employment. The mix among different sectors changes, obviously, um, but in general, it's, it's, it's a positive trend, except in a couple of states where fossil fuels today are a big employer. So for example, in West Virginia, in Kentucky, in Wyoming, in Louisiana, these states um, face the prospect of lower employment uh, and less policy is put in place that, that helps to, to mitigate those, those losses. Another area that we modeled in is what the impact would be on air pollution and public health. And this is, is, is uh, particularly important for urban areas where population densities are higher. And again, it's this, in this case, it's a good news story across the board, um, across all of the pollutant categories that we modeled um, from 260 to 410,000 premature mortalities are avoided by 2050. I'm showing you a couple of the, the more important ones. 
with the closure of coal-fired power plants, you can see it, we clean up um, all of the country um, on the upper set of maps. And then in the lower set, it shows you the, the air pollution de deaths uh, from motor vehicle pollution. And again, because of electrification, most of those go away as well. So <clears throat> that's a quick snapshot of our study. Um, that what, what it really comes through and when you step back is that there are choices and there are risks um, involved in getting to a net zero future. And this is my last slide, just sort of a summing up that the, this high resolution modeling and mapping that we did, it really points to these trade-offs and risks, risks for the US. So a, if we're successful in this transition, um, there are gonna be significant cumulative impacts, both positive and negative, for example, land use impacts, employment impacts, and so on. And those are gonna vary by, by pathway. Um, and what we found is that each of our net zero pathways presents different but similarly daunting challenges to success. So it's a, there's a big job ahead of us and it's, it's time to uh, really roll up the sleeves and get going with it. Um, and our conclusion is that it is achievable to get to net zero and it's affordable if we um, manage the risks um, and begin to, to act and do things today. And the risks that we would particularly worry about are that we, we aren't able to deploy the physical assets and infrastructure at the rates that are needed, which are quite unprecedented. Um, we need a new way of doing, um, doing things to be able to deploy physical assets at this pace. <clears throat> Part of that is, is mobilizing capital um, investment at, again, at an unprecedented rate. Um, and importantly, we need to gain and sustain social license for the transition. There's, there's, um, if we don't have people on board, um, it'll be difficult to move forward uh, in, the, in the way we need to. And then it's also important that um, we keep an eye on those industries that are going to be um, shrunken in the transition, which are fossil fuel industries and the employment that they, they currently have if there's something that uh, isn't opportunities aren't there to replace those um, employment opportunities that has a potential for for sort of slowing down the change. So with that, um, I'll I'll wrap it up. Um, the website there at the bottom of the screen um, is where you can go and you can download the report. You can also uh, explore the data. We've we've posted all of our data so that people can play with it, um, state by state fact sheets and and so on. And I'm going to stay on uh, on the chat and answer questions for a few minutes if people have any uh, chat or the Q&A. Um, so feel free to uh, to put them there. And thank you very much.